Howdy everybody in YouTube land. What we have in front of us today is yet another receiver. And in this case, it is a Pioneer SX3800. Now this receiver is completely dead. Um, for the most part, I think. So I'm pretty sure that it's going to be a power supply fault. And from the little research I've done on this, there's transistors and stuff that tend to go bad in the power supplies from heat and they get noisy and whatever else is going on. I'm not entirely certain, but, uh, so if we look back here, I'm going to go ahead and try to plug this in. I don't know what's going to happen. No, it's on this time around. Oh yeah, that's right. There's no, we get no click out of the speaker. So we have that going for us. Turn that off. Let's see. Oh, turn that down. Oh yeah, that's right. So we've got no tuner action. And it shows the signal being full bars. Yeah, that's what it was. We had an issue with the power supply to the tuner being way too low. And this is not supposed to be lit up when the tuner's not on. So we definitely have something going on with that. And the uh, relay's not clicking in for the speakers. Yeah, so we've got a multiple issue. So the first thing we're going to do before we go anywhere is we got to rebuild the power supply. That way we are starting from a known good state. Now, a lot of people might just troubleshoot this thing, and, and that's true. I could do that, but I know this era of Pioneers have problems with the transistors because I've already done an SX780, a 750, and then a SA8800, so here we are again with the 3800. So I went online a couple years ago, and I bought this SX3800 power supply kit. Probably not necessary, but it's happening anyways. So this, this receiver is not going to be a full restoration unless I absolutely have to. But for the time being, I'm just going to restore the power supply. And this is the instruction sheet that it comes with. So um, I figured I'd go ahead and kind of show this. Go to the Hi-Fi engine and get a free service manual and the audio carom or audio carom audio audio karma. Which that's another thing. Tangentially, I'm noticing forums are dying. Um, it seems to be moving to Facebook groups and stuff like that as time goes on. So whether that thread is still alive or not, I don't know, but so I will carefully scroll through this. If anybody wants to read it, they can pause the video. So let's see, replace capacitors. Tells you which parts sub for which sections here. So this, this information is good for y'all to overlook. That way they don't have they can buy the kit and get the instructions but if not at least here's the instructions so someone could theoretically order the parts to sub them in so there we go we got some caps in here we got some diodes transistors i'm just going to do a basic power supply rebuild just to rule out the problems the potential problems um with the power supply and if there's any other issues with the board we can troubleshoot that after the fact Unless we need to do a full rebuild. So, and then there's another issue with these receivers that I will get to in a second when I get it apart. So in the meantime, let's get this guy apart. All right. So the second thing we have to pay attention to on these amplifiers is back here. Now that I got the rear cover off, right on this heat sink are the power transistors for each channel. Now the Achilles heel of this design is these right here. They socketed the transistors. Like that one's, it's kind of hard to tell through the camera, but that one's kind of tight, but look at this one. 
That one's broken. It's screwed. That one's getting there. This one's, yeah. See what I mean? That's not going to work. So the only way to fix this is to actually physically solder the, the wires directly to the transistors. That makes it harder to remove, but it's the only way to fix that problem properly. Now, um, once that's done, that should take care of any potential. Yeah, that's not going to work. That'll take care of any potential issues that we have with the power output transistors. But I still need to test those and see if they're actually still good because they may not be. There could be a shorted transistor in there. Anyways, besides that, this is the power supply board that we need to, we need to take a look at. And one thing I noticed right away are these filter capacitors. See, that one still looks pretty flat. But look at this one. You see a little bulge right there. Yeah, it's a, uh, that one's toast. That one's fairly flat. This one's, I can feel it. It's bubbled. So that cap there might be shot. And I don't know if those are in the kit that I bought to redo this amplifier. So yeah, this thing's got all kinds of issues. And you can just see down in there, 50, 52nd week of 1979, Yep, Japan. 57th week of 1979. So this is made in 1980. She's old. This is this 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 amplifier is as old as my house cuz the house was built in 1980. So yeah, that puts things into perspective. Now what I'm trying to do is figure out how this board's gonna come out because I don't have a wire wrapping tool and these are soldered anyways so I need to figure out how to get this removed to a point where I can actually work on this board Cause, yeah I don't know if there's screws at the bottom I don't think so no it's just kind of like sitting in there but there's two screws at the top so I think it hinges out slides up um, same ordeal here. I can pull the heatsink assembly completely out. I don't know. We'll, we'll tinker with this. So I pulled these to show you the problem. So these things suffer from brittle plastic disease. And that's what happens is plastic just kind of splits apart, causes this to get loose and it no longer, you know, goes on the transistors anymore. So, yep. That's what happens to these. So you have to either glue this back together and risk it or just solder the wires directly to the power transistors which are under here, which is probably what I'm going to do. It's a little bit fiddly, but I was able to get the boards loose and then um, get all the wires and then the temperature, compensation, diodes, all that stuff loose, all these plugs loose to be able to slide this heatsink assembly out. Because with this out of the way, it's kind of easier to work with and manipulate these boards. So, I think that's how we're going to tactically approach this thing. Um, anyways, now that I got the heatsink out, we can kind of see which output transistors these things use. And they're definitely unusual. Um, at least today. I've not seen that package style in a very long time. So... I'm really hoping that these are good because the likelihood of finding these resistors is probably not that prosperous anyways. And if I do, they're going to be expensive for those transistors. So, alright, let's see what we got here. Oh, this is a 2SC, so it's positive over on the base, so let's check base to emitter. Good. Base to collector. Good. Collector to emitter. Nothing. Okay, let's check this one. This is, oh, no, nope. they did opposites here. It's good. It's good. 
the emitter is always going to be slightly higher than the collector because of the um, phenomenon known as R prime E. So that's okay. And then we're going to do the same thing over here on the 2SA, which is the PNP. That one's good. That one's good. That one's fine. That's good. That's good. So I'll check over here too. All right. All those outputs are good. Thank God. So I don't have to replace those. Um, at this point, I just need to get this board in a, a way where I can manipulate it and then work with that. I think what I want to do is I'm going to try to bend it up and out of the way this way. Because I think I have enough space to be able to do that. Uh, well, potentially. We'll see. Let's get this thing in a spot so I can get it out. The first board I was able to swing up and out of here is the amplifier board, which is this guy here. Now, that's out of the way, and I'm taking a quick note, and we got some crappy solder joints. Like, look at over here, these transistors there. Those need to be resoldered. Same thing over here, those are really bad. You can see the ring cracks in those guys. So, like this one, I think. I think these are even loose. Yeah, so those need to go. That one's the same deal. Like here, you can see it really bad. So yeah, this board needs to be resoldered. Um, I want to do a ESR check on those caps and see what they look like. And if they're okay, I'm gonna leave them. Resolder this board. What kind of drivers are these things using? 2SA-985, 2SC-2275, so there's those. Yeah, I'm gonna, there's wires attached to it, so I'm gonna kind of set that out of the way for now, but that needs attention. Uh, more importantly, I should be able to, with any luck at all, might have to clip some zip ties because I want to be able to swing this up but it doesn't look like I can why not why can't I swing this up that's holding me back oh yeah the ground log so you gotta go you gotta go that should allow me to swing the board it does so now I can swing this guy up and out of the way to work with it. So let's see, what do the solder joints look like here? Oh God, they're atrocious. More cracks. So yeah, I mean, it's, what is it now? 40, well, 44 year old solder, 43 year old solder. So I'm not surprised. And I've had this unit for five years now, so. And it's not been used at all because it needed repair when I got it. Yeah, there's a ton of bad solder joints, but perhaps more importantly. Oh, wow, that one's completely broke free. That's bad. Look at that. Wow. No way that capacitor is working. Well, it's not working anyways, because... Oh, man. All right, well... Anyways, those caps have to come out and be replaced. And the kit doesn't have those filters. Those main filters are not in the kit, so... I'm going to have to buy those separately. That's not a big deal. It just it sucks, because now i got to make a multiple order. Ah... <sighs> Yeah. All right. Well. Yep. She needs some resoldering. But you see how hot those transistors get? They even discolor the PCB. That's what I mean. They're kind of known to go bad from just pure heat exposure. So we don't have a choice but to handle these. I mean, look at this. You see the circuit glue down there? It's just all brown and corrosive. So that's all got to come out. Let's see, 12,056 volts. I don't know if they make a 56 volt anymore. 
But yeah, you can see the bulge on the top one versus that one. So, yep, they gotta go. Damn. Oh, well, there's some, there's one back there. It definitely has to go. So this board definitely needed attention, which I knew it did. You can see this wax drippage coming off of this one. Check the fuses. They look good, but I gotta physically check them. Yeah, they've got it. Man. Okay. All right, that's enough screwing around. So, okay, it's time to start pulling off parts and recapping this board and putting the new transistors on this board. I still have to order those, so I gotta wait for those to come in, but. I want to at least get these two boards taken care of and see what this thing does. Um, if, it, if I get anything at all. Um, and then I think the issue with the tuner being dead is secondary. But it could be a missing voltage up here. But I think it's secondary. So anyways, let's take care of the problem that's staring us in the face. And then we'll work on the secondaries after that. Got all of the capacitors in that needed to go in. So that's all in there. I don't have these two yet because I need to order them, but I got everything else in there. Um, all the old ones are back there. Some of those are just baked out, but they're all changed. Uh, the next part to this task is I got to get the transistors in there. And I'll cut in here with any notes that are required to help you do this. So... Uh, I think I'm going to do the ones on the heat sinks first because I want to clean all that crap out that's underneath there, the baked out glue, and do these. Because according to the documentation, these are replaced and substituted with TIP41 and TIP42 transistors, which should have the same pinout, so they should be just a direct drop-in replacement. So I took the transistor out, the first one so far, and this thermal paste is 100% just baked out. So we are going to clear all of that crap off and we're going to put new paste on it. Now, it says in the documentation you should do that anyways, but I figured I would go ahead and video this. Um, because this is just common practice when changing things like this anyway. So we're going to add fresh paste on that and we're going to put the new, the tip 40, let's see. The tip 41s go in place of these uh, 2SD 313s. And then the tip 42, which is here, goes in place of the 2SB507, which is right there. So, but when you're doing these transistors, I mean, we've, we're getting the new ones into these heatsink ones and they follow the same. But now we're onto this small signal one here that has an E marked at the end. Well, that E means emitter, okay? Now... Most transistors are industry standard, right? So the original transistor I pulled out, which is this one here, it's a 2SC, you can't see it, 2SC2575, right? Now the 2SC2575, it says that it, in the documentation that it's replaced with these, which is the KSC2343? No, 83, 2383, okay, so now, we don't know which way they go in because they may not be the same pinout. You can't always assume that. These typically are, but these are not. So uh, when I'm using the multimeter, now you can get one of those little cheap component testers and they'll tell you too, but I'm old school, so I use the multimeter. And right now the base is on this rightmost pin when the label is facing you. So I know the base is here. So it goes base, collector, emitter, right? Industry standard doesn't mean this, this it doesn't go base emitter collector it doesn't go you know it doesn't do that it always goes the collector the emitter is always on the end when the base is on the opposite end typically sometimes you see the base in the middle and then it goes collector emitter or emitter collector it doesn't matter now in this case this goes base collector emitter well with the board labeled the way it is we know emitter is on one end which means the base has to be on the other end which also means that this transistor right here goes in like this with the label facing that way. So just pay attention when you're installing the new transistors in for this reason. So here's another instance 
Now, this 2SC1915 is supposed to be substituted by this KSC2690, which I've used a ton of these in car audio, right? Well, just on my experience with these, I know the bass is going to be on the right-hand side of this. So it's going to go bass, collector, emitter. Now, this one is the exact opposite. Bass is on this side, so it goes bass, collector, emitter, which means this one has to be installed in reverse compared to it was originally in this board. So, again, it's just some things you have to test for and be mindful of when you're replacing these transistors. So we're going to do that for the rest of these. I got all the diodes installed here, and I got the new ones installed there, which they probably didn't need changed, but they came with the kit, so why not? So I'm going to do the rest of these, and then that leaves the Zener diodes, which I don't know specifically where those go just yet. All right, so on this next part, we have uh, three, we have five diodes we need to change, right? And it goes into here. It says we have the diodes to replace, the four black big ones, and then the six smaller black ones, which we did. Those are pretty self-explanatory because they're easy to figure out. But then it says there are two 1S155, 1S2776 diodes at D208 and 215. These are replaced with the 4148 small glass general purpose. Now, 208 and 215, here's the thing. Here's the problem. So, this board is not labeled anywhere. So, I do not know where 208 and 215 are. So, we have to refer to the actual schematic from Hi-Fi Engine. So, we need to find 208 and 215. So, if we bring this in here, there's 215, which... Let's see, 215 is right next to the notch, and then there's a Zener. So, that means we have a Zener. Nope, this is not the same. Oh, yeah, it is. There it is. There's the Zener, and then there's the 215. So, yeah, that's the back side of the board, is it? Yeah, it is. That's the back side. So that is the back side of the board right there. So, okay. 215. And then we need 208. So we know, judging by what it looks like, so we know that is one of them right there. So the other one is going to be down here. No, nope, it's right there. Oh, it's got a resistor piggybacked on it. I doubt it's bad, to be honest. So, I bet you that is. That's 215. And we need 208. So, there's 215. Where's 208, guys? I'm sure someone's in a screaming at me through the screen right now. Oh, there it is, 208. Yeah, that's what I thought. That is literally next to the 2.2K, which is where I thought it was, right there. Oh, uh, I do not feel like messing with that. So, I'm going to be lazy and don't do what I'm about to do, but I'm going to leave that alone. Uh, yeah, but I will replace the other one because it's easy to get to. So we'll replace that one. And then it says that we need to, uh, there's a 14 volt Zener at 207. Anyways, if we follow those instructions, we can look on this schematic here and be able to determine where everything is. So you will need this board diagram to determine where those diodes go into this board. So I figured I would go ahead and insert this as a cliff note. So let's proceed on with the component replacement. Unfortunately, once again, this little D-E-R-E-E -E guy let me down. Now, there's nothing wrong with this thing. It's just, it won't read the capacitance of this guy. They're too high. This is uh, 12,000. And it just gives me OL when I try to read them. So, we'll move on to the next best thing. This guy here. So this is this is probably the only one I have that's going to actually work for this situation. So let's check capacitor number one. Does this one have the bulge? No. That one has the bulge. So let's do this one first. So we're going to connect you 
Now, I don't know how to use this capacitor meter because this is the first time I'm actually using this thing. It thinks it's a resistor. So, that can't be good. Well, no, there it goes. 7,000 microfarad 1.0. I don't know what the QD, theta, I don't know. There's the ESR. 21, that's pretty good on ESR, but look at the capacitance. We're low. That's 7,000. It needs to be 12. All right, so that cap is wasted. Not surprised there. Uh, let's check this guy. So let's figure out where you are. Yeah, 5,000. That's less than half of what it should be. So, ESR is still good, but look at the ca the capacitance. So, yeah, these guys are shot. I'm going to have to go online and find the an equivalent one that will go in there and replace them. So, we'll come back once we get the parts to replace them. All right, so what I did temporarily in case I need to order more parts from Mauser because it doesn't make sense if I order just these and then have to order something else. So I just tacked these in here. The amplifier is not going to work, obviously, because it's just kind of dangling over here on the side. But these are in, and I want to see if any of this stuff comes alive. So here we go. It does. Look at this nice it works yep it's it's tuning something in nice it's working wow it's working so this operation has been restored so it was definitely the power supply now, we don't have any audio or anything because we're not going to. Because we have no, um, you know, none of the amplifiers hooked up. But that's fine. That seems a little dim. It could be, hold on. Eh, eh, it could be a blown bulb. Who knows? It's hard to say. Anyways. Do I have any FM at all? Probably not, because I don't have any antennas. Whoa, 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 almost. Picked up something there. Anyways, that's a good sign. So I think I can proceed with purchasing the capacitors and then hope the amplifier is good. So, yeah, because I'm not going to put the amplifier back in there and put all that back together just to tear it all the way apart again if there's a problem with the, uh... Yeah, anyways. Moving right along. Alright, so now that I got the new capacitors in to go into these rail cap places here, I'm pretty sure... They don't make these foot... They don't make this footprint anymore. As far as I'm aware of. I've not been able to find it. So I don't think they make that footprint anymore. So... Like I've done in previous videos, what I'm going to have to do most likely in order to get those mounted is I'm going to have to drill some holes in here to try to get this to fit in place. So let's go ahead and get those removed back out of there so I can drill the holes. So here's what I've done. I soldered it through one of the existing holes and then just have this guy coming through a hole that doesn't go to anything because I'm just going to wrap a wire here and solder it straight to there on those. Um, and I think I can get away with that because the original cap was so tall that they have, a, you can see a mark here where the plate was. Now what plate I'm talking about is this support plate right here. So there was a plate that went right here that held the original caps in place. Well, these new caps are so short it's not even going to make it to this plate, so this plate doesn't even matter anymore. Um, because the caps are more shallow than the mark where the plate actually made, so that doesn't even matter anymore. So I think I can get away with just doing it this way and then just strapping down a wire here and here. 
to be able to get those to clear in because the reason why is these aren't in the original spots anymore they're offset closer to the top so they're not going to fit in that anyways but they're so shallow it doesn't matter all right proceeding on the method i chose to go with here is i took a piece of soldering braid and i soldered it through the hole there by trimming the the uh braid back a little because the original width is not going to fit in this hole so I train it actually does a little bit but I went ahead and did that there and then I looped it around to create a mechanical connection here and soldered it so that should be solid um, I'm going to do the same thing over there just have to be careful to keep it away from this trace here I don't want to short it across which it shouldn't anyway because it's masked but you know how that is vibration and stuff like that you just never know what can happen in the future so just be aware and there we go both are complete i just humped this one up a little more so it won't run into that trace again looping it around and formed a solid connection so we'll go ahead and get this guy put back together and let's hope that this thing engages in their sound now i do need to get the front panel off because there's some bulbs back here that need replaced that's the next thing once i know everything else functions so I need to determine what it takes to remove that, which they're all the same from any other unit. I just got to take the screws around and pull the knobs off and the switch contacts and stuff off. And it just out it goes because I want to spray those controls and stuff, too. So first off, though, let's make sure the primary problem is solved. So the next part of this task is to get these wires back onto the transistors. Now. This plastic here is breaking apart and it's super brittle, so that's not going to work anymore. So, before I put this metal heat sink in, I did take these clamps out so I can get that spring steel out of the way. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to unwrap this wire and I'm going to solder this wire directly onto the terminals, bypassing these plugs, which are basically shot anyway. So, just remember which way they go on, of course. So in this one, it goes yellow, red, and green. Yellow, red, and green. And this one's going to go brown, orange, and blue. And the same thing over here. Brown, orange, and blue. And then yellow, red, and green. So we're going to take care of that next. All right, now that we got that taken care of, all the old parts are just laying over there but I got all four of them completely done so I got what I did was I just left a couple of loops on there and soldered down to try to form a mechanical connection so red green and yellow blue orange brown blue orange brown red green and yellow just that way we don't get it backwards because the last thing we do is just explode this thing into a ball of flames because something's backwards Okay, um, all of the plugs and everything are in place, so here goes nothing. I have not powered this up yet prior to starting this video clip, so nothing exploded, no smoke. We don't get any click from the relay, so we're still not out of protection. We need to find out why that is. Um, thing is, we need to measure the DC offset before we get into the relay, which we can't get to the contact points because we're way down there. Now, what I did do was I made this incredibly more difficult to remove now because I have these solder directly on the transistor so if i need to service this i have to take this out as a group now which is still not a big deal i can still unplug the power supply board so that's not a big deal um anyways i need to figure out what kind of dc output swing i've got from the uh power supply stage now i'm finding many more bad solder joints across this thing like i can see them here on these connectors so, I mean, this is going to be problematic throughout the whole thing. So, I will have to pay attention to that. This meter always freaks out. Alright, so let's power on. And let's see what we're getting on the DC offset here. If I can reach it. 
course not. It's, <laughs> the probe is just too short. Ah! Dang. Really? Can I get to it back here? Nope. There's no safe way to get to that. Alright, well, let me check at the transistors. Let's check the emitters. 65 millivolts. It's very noisy. So you check the collector. That's about what I expected. Check this emitter, too. And it's kind of noisy, but nothing that would be causing me grief. Okay, so let's check the emitter on this one. Whoa, yeah, that's way off. Check the emitter on that one. Yeah, that DC offset's too high. Because if I check the PNP's emitter output, we're negative 227 millivolts, and it's just bouncing all over the place. So we've got more bad transistors. That's the differential input pair that causes that. It's like a 2SA733. It's got five pins on it, something like that. That's bad. And this one is less than half of that. So that means we're going to have about 100 millivolts of offset on the output of the amplifier. So in case you're curious, I'm testing them here and here. All right, so let's check rail voltage balance. What do we have? Positive 47 volts, negative 47. So the rail is perfectly balanced. So we don't have any problems there anymore. At least we shouldn't because we got new caps. So I have no way to, can't get under there. So, okay, we know we have a problem with that channel. The offset is off. However, what I do want to do is I want to hook something in here and see if I get at least AC output, some kind of a waveform on the multimeter generated by the output stage. So, but we've definitely got noisy transistors. I'm not surprised. Every single one of these uh, 70s, early 80s pioneers have this problem. So I've got to rebuild that board next. So I've done some more troubleshooting with this. Now, if I freeze spray, cause I got my spray here. If I freeze spray these offset or these primary input differential amp transistors, it'll cause the offset to go wild, of course. But I'm able to get to it from the top side here and here. And I did some quick measurements and I was only getting like 0.1 to 0.2 offset on this side and almost nothing on this side. So that's not enough to cause the relay not to engage. So I did some quick looking at the schematic here. So here's what I've discovered so far. The path of offset detection occurs here through this 15K on that channel and then from the other channel, which is off screen to this 15K. So both of these come together into this transistor pair. The way this actually works is if it detects DC offset high enough, it'll turn these transistors on, which will ground this through the capacitor and all this stuff. So it's got like a recovery time. So anyways, it grounds it and it turns this transistor off. All right. So I checked this point here and I've got about uh, anywhere between 12 to 15 volts sitting here. So this is not engaged. So this is about 12 to 15 volts on this Zener diode. So now the way this actually works is this rail voltage comes up. And if this is not engaged, this RC time constant will slowly build a voltage across this resistor network and turn this transistor on. This is what gives you the delay before the relay clicks on after you turn it on. So that's the time constant for that. Now, if that capacitor is bad, you're going to have problems. It'll just come on immediately. Um, or may not even come on at all, really. But I had like 0.7 volts at this transistor, okay? But the relay was not engaged. I had 47 volts here and 0.7. So by all intents and purposes, this transistor should be kicked on. That relay should be engaged, but it is not. So that tells me that transistor is bad. So I kicked it on again. Now we get a click. See that? And all I did 
was take the free spray and spray this transistor and it started chattering. It was like, and then click. Now it won't do it anymore. And nothing is hot in here. It hasn't been on long enough. But if we look carefully, there, this is one of those stupid transistors that's not a molded transistor like this one here, like we see today. You can see where there's two halves molded together on the one, there are the two on the left. That's how most ordinary transistors are made. But no, this one is, is one of those epoxy filled styled transistors. Almost every electronic device that I've ever worked on and many of other people worked on, these particular transistors are just known for going bad. They almost always go bad. Now, what is this one? This is a 2SC1384. I can probably use a KSC2690 there um, in its place to fix this problem. So I'll probably do that. But right now it's engaged, which I'm surprised. Uh, but now that I got an audio amp, do we have anything on the VU meters? I don't know if we do or not. On, no muting. I don't, FM muting off. We do. Hey. We got view meter action. That means the amplifiers are working. Nice. So actually, why don't we, let's see, on camera, I haven't done this yet. So let's just, for grins and shiggles, let's uh, connect a, a, you know, a, a speaker into this thing. I've only got one speaker under the bench, so I can only check one channel effectively. At least with this particular setup, anyways. Nope, oh, I hear static. I hear static. I got him. Oh, yeah, I'm going to have to spray these pots here. Yeah, big time. Let's see, do we have anything? No. Whoa. In airport workers. For decades, first responders and firefighters at military bases and airports used a chemical-based foam to fight fires. Studies have shown that chemicals used to make aqueous film forming foam or AFM wow, it's are working. toxic to humans and have been associated with several types of cancer. Wow. No was exposed to AFFF and were diagnosed with any of these cancers. Well, we're gonna have to pull that transistor and replace it, so I think I'm going to run this for a little bit before I do, because there's some little piddly things I got to do. Like I said, like I said, I got to change the, there's a bulb in here that's blown. That's got to be replaced. These are all light bulbs. So we'll do that. We'll change that transistor. But I think for now, I've reached a good point where I can actually test this thing for a while. And Franklin and Nanta Hala Flooring Paint at Home Center. Thank you for shopping locally. Now, Smoky Mountain weather from our staff meteorologist. Showers could disrupt some of your St. Patrick's Day plans today, so make sure to keep the umbrella handy. We'll watch for off and on coverage here throughout today. And Here's what makes vinyl cool. You can play with it. So this thing has to be torn all the way apart to get to the switches and the pots and all that stuff. And you can't, because these bulbs are in the way, you can't get those bulbs out because they go under here. And you can't get under there until you take this off. It's such a pain in the ass. So I already cut the old bulbs out that were blown over here. And those are now out of the way. So at this point i got to figure out, okay, the dial string. So... The dial string comes, it wraps around through here, here, up and over, back through, 
wraps around this drum at least three times and then comes back around this top pulley and then wraps all the way around there looks like it comes out the middle and then the other one uh, yeah so the bottom one comes around and over it goes up underneath on the the left side here which comes up and around and hooks right there it's, it's right here but the other one comes up and exits there and wraps itself all the way around until it gets to this spring here and that's with the pointer all the way at the end so that's how this dial cord is strung so I'm gonna have to remove this dial cord in order to get this apart yeah it's fun all right so now that I got that moved out of the way I can actually access everything uh, first thing I did was I grouped these wires that went to the lamps originally I used electrical tape to do that just so I didn't have to make it more difficult on myself than I wanted to um, I got some replacement bulbs five of them I forget how much they cost because it's been a couple of years since I ordered them got it from this person here now I don't know if he makes these things by hand but the bulbs work fine the problem with this is he's, his shipping's kind of eh, but other than that, seems to be a quality product. Not really an endorsement, just this is where I got them. And that's all ready to go. I was able to get access to this so I can remove that. Because I had to remove that in order to get the face off. It's just, it's a crazy design, but yeah it is what it is anyways so that's out of the way the dial cord and all that stuff's out of the way now and at this point while i have this apart i can go ahead and clean the switches now i tried to spray and clean these switches before and i couldn't well that's why the cable runs all the way in the back but all right so let's go ahead and start getting all of these switches cleaned up get all these pots cleaned up and try to move on with this hopefully the thing with this particular unit and a lot of these units in general is it's very fiddly it's very fiddly to get this thing apart and get it back together because now I've got to route all the wires through here where I put the lamps in which are just kind of like sitting up under there but before I can do that I had to pull this board out which is one of the, the top layer input board and I had to unplug all this to do that um, that way I can get down to these switches here because they need sprayed. These are the ones that I'm having the most problems with. But, anyways, while I had this board out, I went ahead and resoldered some of this stuff too. Perhaps one of the most interesting things, actually there's a couple interesting things here. We have an AM stereo out. That's interesting. Maybe this uses an, an outboard CQAM decoder, demodulator. But there's no way to put it in unless you go in here. But perhaps even more interestingly, the FM de emphasis is 25 and 75. Well, in the Americas, it's 50. So 25, I'm not sure what that's about. 75 is a European standard. So I find that interesting as well. And, and it's an American unit because it's rated for 120 volts, not 100 volts like a, like Japan. So I don't know. That's weird. I'm just finding little things like that. So. Anyways, I'm going to go ahead and spray these out with the uh, cheapo contact cleaner. Um, deoxid's great and all, but you don't need it for switches. You only need it for pots, and you do not want to spray these in the pots. But anyway, so let's go ahead and take care of that, and then let's get this thing back together slowly but surely. All right, well, that was painful. So I got this thing all together now the, trying to get these in here were completely fiddly but I got them in there now um, I have not strung the dial cord yet because I need to make sure everything else is working um, uh, and I had to replace the bulb here because that one burned out as well so let's get the power plugged in see what we got all right Relay engaged. No sound. That's why. All right, so that works.
this is still a problem. I sprayed this thing out good too. This is still a problem. I think what I'm going to have to do with that, I hate this, but I'm probably going to have to pull this thing completely apart and take that switch off the board and try to take the switch apart and fix it, clean it. See, these crisscross, so... Yeah, that's the one that's on the complete edge of the board. So, yeah. More things to figure out. Here. You can see it in the meter. Anyways. That works, that works, that works. So all four of my lights work now. Um, yep. might have to do that one too all right so that switch is going to have to come out and then these two switches again they snake all the way to the back and go to the back here so i'm going to have to spray those but i got to take the rear cover off to do that so uh it's one thing after another with this dang thing i don't know how many more of these i'm ever going to work on all right, so I went ahead and took the switch out and took it apart. And you can just clearly tell that this thing is bad. Even with the contact cleaner, I couldn't clean that up. So the only way to fix that going forward is to take a piece of this emery cloth, just like I did with that um, Zenith TV with the tuner, and just go at these contacts and then put a little bit of actual deoxid on it to try to protect it. Hopefully that fixes the problem. Well, copyright. So I got the dial cord all, or dial cord all strung in. Everything's good there. So I think at this point, I'm just going to start putting this guy back together. This switch here is fixed. I don't have a problem with it anymore. And yeah, we have a local station on AM that transmits music. We have a local station on AM that transmits music, and this is actually a translator for 104.9, which is the FM station. So, And the interesting thing is, that is the only station that comes in on this thing. Because if I tune off, nothing else comes in. That's the only station. Now, I don't have an antenna or anything hooked up, just the bar antenna, so... Yeah, it's the only one that comes in. Now, I've noticed, like, 1050 is a little bit off. If I move over to FM, 102, that's exactly on 102. So, it is, the dial is lined up, but it, it loses, if I go further out, it's slightly, slightly off, but close enough to where it works. Go to the other end, it's moving on like 90. Yeah, it's close enough. Now, on AM, I think it's... Like this is 1000, so if I put it right on top of 1000, we're not even close. So the oscillator is slightly off on AM as far as the dial position to the internal oscillator, because this is measuring the internal oscillator. So, anyways, uh, I'm going to go ahead and get this thing back together and move on because i think we're done we got everything cleaned up we got everything that needed replaced replaced the lamps are replaced um i'm out of lamps i don't know if the stereo lamp and all that stuff works yet because well i'm out of those i'm out of lamps now so all right let's get this guy back together and we're going to wrap this thing up i think we're pretty much done now all the switches are cleaned out this one's been repaired where i had to 
sand up the contacts. And it, again, it was fiddly getting it in there. So, yeah, seems to be working fine. So, alrighty then. Let's clean it up and get it together. Sounds amazing. Holy shit. One of those 90s artists that never really made it. <laughs> 